Hey everybody, it's Matt Powers. I'm a seed saver, gardener, family guy, and I teach people all over the world how to live more regeneratively. And today I wanna to answer a question that I get almost every single day. How, with no money, with very little resources, very little time, can I make soil? Can I make this garden happen? Can I turn this field or this clay or this sand? And we're talking about acres usually. It's sometimes a, a single person and they're moving on to, you know, broken land or a couple, but most often it's the single mom with a few kids and she wants to know how with her limited time, no large equipment and working multiple jobs and just having enough money to, you know, put food on the table. So I'm going to answer that question because as a school teacher in the lowest paying county in California, I had to figure this out myself and get really good at gardening in a place where people told me it wasn't possible, where they told me that it was too hot, where they told me that um, it you couldn't fend off the deer, you couldn't grow nutritious food, and I was able to prove them wrong by focusing on soil building. And that's what I want to talk about today. So I've already done a video about the five cousins, so I'm not gonna go too deeply into them right now. You just throw sow them all together, you make sure those cowpeas are soaked overnight, and they grow incredibly well. Um, if you don't have all the seeds, they still do well, even some of the cousins. I mean, if you think about it, you know, um, all of these have been featured in other cover crops, either singularly, like just daikon radish, nothing else, or cowpeas and nothing else, or in combinations, like um, they have certain things in there like daikon radish that they do in mixes for fall cover crops and, and early spring or winter cover crops, depending on where you are. So these things should be familiar to you, but you can actually do this with weeds. You can do this with the weeds that are growing in the field as long as they're really annuals. If you're dealing with more perennial things, you wanna take those down to the ground and then start chopping and dropping their sprouts. So chopping and dropping these five cousins is the next step in the process for anyone that's following that video. If you're wondering what comes next after you plant, after you grow them, and after they do their full thing, we've got a lot of seed pods here. Um, and that's because we're nearing the end of our season here in California, and we're gonna be able to seed save some of this. We're gonna be able to chop the rest of it down and turn it into incredible soil so we start off next year with a new layer of new soil and it's going to have a great amount of fertility in it because we planned for it because we designed for it now this is very simple but when we talk about it and we try to apply it in the macro this is kind of where things get um get confusing or um don't make sense to, to folks so if you if you've got these seeds and the, that sorghum up here behind me um, if you've got seeds like this and they're growing you're you're doing some of the work right because half that sorghum half the carbon that it's pulling out of the air is going into the ground and going into the soil and then we're going to chop it and drop it and we're going to um, cut it as much as possible into small parts and then we're going to um, be spraying this down with EM and compost tea and everything to bring it down to decompose it in place to break it down as quickly as possible and make it more bioavailable to the life and then to plants and then we're going to be able to cover this um, either with um, that mulch or, or, or straw or cover it with seed depending on um, how we time it depending on what we do you can make you know, uh, some distance uh, between some of these fall, uh, fallen plants after you chop and drop them. And you can plant in furrows in those, in those clear uh, dirt patches or straight lines if you like that, uh, or pockets if you will. And you can be doing that all winter and then doing a winter crop as this grows, then chopping and dropping that. And so you're continuously growing in here perhaps, or you're just chopping and dropping and then the snows come and they cover it. Now, I have done this with a knife. This is my original, my original permaculture tools knife. I love this thing. This was lost and it came back to me through two different states. And so I, for this patch, you know, I can chop and drop it and do all that. But 
for many of these people, they are talking about acres. So what do you do there, Matt? You know, it's, 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 it's nice and great that you have the physical ability and to go out there and just use a knife to create soil. Through the so seeds, I can do that. But going out there and bending over and chopping and dropping, you know, I'm not doing yoga every morning like you. I've got this going on or that going on. So what we really need to do is develop relationships with our community so that we can borrow or have people come over or trade their time um, or just as a favor, as a friend, to quickly go over our fields with a harrow or a flail mower, but something that will take all of this down so that this gets turned into soil really effectively. And we can go out there, we can, you know, involve, you know, teams of young young folk to, to chop things down and give them sharp implements and whatnot. But this could, you know, if acres of this could be taken down and flailed within an afternoon, and um, it could be your friend, it could be your neighbor, it could be someone else you know, from your church, your local community, your permaculture meetup group. But sharing these larger resources like the tractors, the flail mowers, the key line plows, is really critical to be able to, as a community, lower the barrier of entry, lower the cost of entry to doing the larger scale soil remediation. So she could go out there, you know, and chop and drop, you know, um, in her spare spare time. But she's already working three jobs. She's got six acres to do, um, and she she's gonna throw these seeds down. But she can't go out there and chop it all down. Maybe she's got three young children. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. But but the reality is is that we really need to at that scale rely upon some machine or favor or both to actually bring it down. So we have the solutions. We have very simple, you know, clear pathways to very low cost. Uh, and, and these seeds, I mean, they could be the weeds, pigweed, okay, in some of the fields. It's its cousin to pigweed. This is a, a awesome variety, no doubt, an heirloom. But then we get down here and you're like, oh, there's the daikon radish. Well, you know, um, mustard is a cousin. It's in the brassica family and the leaves look very similar. So that it grows just like a weed. And the root is just like a, a skinny version, you know, of, of the daikon root and the mustard plant. Well, the mustard plant's actually earlier, so the daikon's later in evolution, I am very sure. Um, so we, we've got this situation where these things are analogous to so many weeds. And remember that weeds are reparative mechanisms. They're actually accumulating the nutrients that that soil is calling for to bioremediate it, to push it further in succession, to repair the degradation. And that's why we, weeds are just really incredible indicators of what's wrong with the soil. Their root structure and type tell you if the soil is too loose, if the soil is compacted, if the soil has a compaction layer. I mean, there, there are so many different things that you can get from looking at the root structure of some of these weeds. So don't, don't get angry at the weeds. Leverage the weeds. Let them teach us. And then let's jumpstart it. Let's take it to the next level. Let's find that weed's cousin that bioaccumulates that thing that the soil needs badly at such a higher, faster rate that we can suddenly, you know, seal those problems up and move forward into deep fertility and deep nutrient density. These things can happen and will happen if we provide the organic matter, if we're providing the root exudates, if we are not tilling, and if we're breaking things down um, seasonally in a way that, 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 that works. So we want to avoid all the chemicals, we want to avoid the detrimental sprays, we want to avoid any of those artificial synthetic things. We want to rely upon nature and the patterns of nature because this is permaculture. And so we're going to be chopping and dropping this. We're going to be doing some, some things by hand. But in the future, maybe on this 90 acres, it's actually oh, 90 plus acres, we're going to probably be having some help, having some machinery. So we'll be having, a, you know, maybe a little bit of a, maybe friends will bring machinery. But at the larger scale, you have to do that. You have to rely upon your community and you might have to rely upon machines. But all these things can be done on the small scale. All these things can be done inexpensively and you can start now. And one final thing I'll say is they have very clay soil, the six acres. And so the number one thing I said to them 
they must not do is add sand because sand plus clay equals concrete. And we don't like that. No one likes that, all right? <laughs> so let's make amazing soil happen. Let's build soil everywhere. And uh, keep the questions coming because uh, I'll keep making videos. Thank you. To just quickly go over our fields with a harrow, a harrow la la la, you have to reply, rely upon your community. And you might have to reply, rely on... <laughs>